So I'm Peter Bergen, and uh, thank you to the brilliant Daniel Rothenberg, Rosa Brooks, and Rob Johnson for their discussion of some of the themes uh, that I'm going to discuss with Sir Lawrence Friedman. Sir Lawrence Friedman has been a professor uh, at the, in the War Studies Department uh, at King's College since 1982. He's really, in many ways, the dean of the study of war. And he uh, has written a number of books, including Strategy, uh, which we're going to discuss this, uh, now, which, is, by the way, is available for sale along with a lot of other books in the sort of bookshop we have outside those doors over, over here. Um, and he is also writing a book, uh, which he's completing, which is actually called The Future of War. So we thought that that would be a, a useful thing to discuss as well. So, you know, a basic question is, what is strategy and does it change over time? Well, so strategy is something that people do. Uh, and they, and they, part of the objective of the book was to look at the way that people have conceptualized strategy over time. I mean, if you just follow the literature, people didn't do strategy before the late 18th century because the word wasn't used. So they talked about the art of war or something else. But clearly, they were doing something that we would recognize as strategy. And it's essentially how you make your choices um, about dealing with the problems at hand uh, and trying to create a better situation than you might be expecting just looking at the resources you've got and the resources your opponents have got. So I talk about strategy as the art of creating power, which is basically uh, the ability to um, extract from a situation more than you might reasonably expect. But of course, it can also be um, if you get it wrong, the art of subtracting power. A bad strategy means that you just get into a mess. Well, let's consider then <coughs> what I think was one of the great strategic failures of recent history, which was 9-11. Hmm. I mean, bin Laden had a theory of the case that by attacking us on 9-11, uh, that the United States would put out, pull out of the Middle East and all the American-backed regimes would then fall. I mean, yep. he had a strategy. It was just a very bad one. Indeed. He had a tactical success, just, just as Pearl Harbor was for the Japanese, that it, you know, it led to their defeat. So to what extent, I mean, people have strategies. Most of them appear to be pretty bad. Hmm. Yeah, so strategy is very hard, and yeah. it's often disappointing. Uh, uh, but you have to do it anyway, because you've, you've got to take some decisions, and you can't just give up. So. Um, what you're trying to do is, wor is work out causation. You have to have a theory of causation. Bin Laden example you've uh, given, Peter, and written about so well it, it, it is, a, it is a clear one. He, he thought, looking back at Somalia and Beirut, that if you hit the Americans hard enough, they just ran away. Uh, whereas he didn't quite understand if you hit the Americans bang in the middle of their, uh, <laughs> uh, their major cities, they might have a slightly different reaction. Um, and you would have thought people might have been able to tell him that. Uh, so it was a bad strategy, but it's, strategy isn't a single event. It, it, it's a process. It's a series of adjustments and so on. And so he had to work out another strategy after that strategy. To that, he couldn't find a much better one, but others learned from it uh, and developed it. So the importance um, in all of these things is not to think about strategy um, as a single product, uh, but it's a process of constant adaption and evaluation uh, and reconsideration of events because new possibilities open up other, even as some others are, are closed down. Um, and I think one of the, the problems with strategy is you hear so often demands for better strategy, we must have great strategy, as if there's some sort of magic ingredient that if only you insert it into the body politic, wise decisions will be made where only foolish ones made before. But it's actually very difficult because there are lots of moving parts, lots of different players. Uh, and if you fix on something, say this is our strategy, you're going to be disappointed because somebody else, A, knows that, and B, has got their own uh, objectives, their own interests, and they're going to come in and uh, frustrate what you're trying to do. So it requires this continual uh, reflection and adaption. You begin uh, your book with a wonderful quote from Mike Tyson, uh, who says, you know, everybody has a plan till they get hit in the mouth. Mm. So <laughs> what did you mean? Why did you begin the book with that? Um, well, partly because I'm old enough to get away with it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think, I, I mean, I like because it, it just captured a very basic point, Strat which is part of what I'm following, is that strategy is not a plan. 
uh, involves plans, involves planning, but it isn't a plan by itself because a plan suggests a sequence of events that is going to reach a defined objective. Uh, and I want to get people away from that idea. And the other obvious quote is uh, the more um, uh, professional one is, is von Moltke's uh, is, no, is no plan survives contact with the enemy. It's the same mm. basic point. Um, so first, people should uh, accept that, that whatever they think is going to happen, it'll be different, and they need to prepare for that. Secondly, not to think in terms of a defined end. Um, a described strategy, uh, policy, it's, it's, it's a soap opera. Uh, one thing leads to another. You think you've achieved the victory, but you've just got to a new stage, and then you've got to deal with the new stage. Uh, so the, 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 it's really just a reiteration of the point I was making before of the importance of, um, of recognizing that once you're engaged uh, in an encounter with, with other actors, uh, you're not in complete control of the situation. One of our fellows at New America, Scott Silverstone, who's here and who teaches at West Point, is, is doing a book about preventative war mm. and sort of the, the temptations and obviously in 2003, we had a classic pre preventative war in Iraq, and you've been engaged in the study of that war in an, an official capacity. Yeah. So, I mean, preventative wars, do they ever work? Are they, are they, are they, are they part of a strategic plan that, that makes sense, or are they just generally sort of fizzle and fail? Well, I mean, the, the, there's lots of... Um I mean, we need to distinguish between a preemptive war and a preventative war. Preemptive is you think you're about to be attacked and you do something about it. Um, and you can say Israel in 67 was, was preemptive in that way. Uh, and, and if it was, it was successful. Or actually, Argentina in, in 82 believed it, it was preempting something the British weren't actually going to do, um, but it, and it wasn't successful. Uh, so that, that's preemptive. Preventive is saying, well, we think there's going to be a shift in the, in the power structure. So unless we act quickly, um, uh, then in a few years' time, 10 years' time, we're going to be in trouble. And uh, you know, one example of that, I mean, one factor, is one of the factors in July 14, and the, the, Germans, the German view that Russia was going to get stronger, and if they didn't move quite quickly. It wasn't the only factor, obviously, but it's one of the factors there. So I think statesmen, women, have views of changing power balances, uh, and that will give some urgency to their moves. But the trouble with preventive war uh, is you're turning something that's a possibility for the future into a reality now. Uh, and if you're not absolutely sure um, that you are the stronger one at that particular moment, uh, then you're going to get into trouble. And anyway, I think it's a sort of thinking, you can still see that sort of thinking at quite local levels, um, but for great powers, I think it's one hell of a gamble. Uh, and you can, you know, you just look back at these, 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 we see the books now on the rise of China and how you need to deal with that now. You know, 30 years ago, you had similar books on the rise of Japan and how we did, had to deal with it now. Um, and, you know, you're grateful that nobody took much notice of it 30 years ago <laughs> uh, because it's, it's this very sort of crude, formulaic way of, of looking at the shifts in international balances. We've talked uh, today about drones and <coughs> bioengineering and other sort of exotic, uh, you know, uh, new, new forms of warfare. Um, do any of those, let's assume that they happen and are important uh, going forward, do any of those actually change strategy? I mean, you meant in your book you talk about, I mean, maps, the mm. invention of useful maps obviously had an impact. Yeah. I mean, is it, what do you see in the future might actually change the way we think strategically? Well, what, what, what's happening is options are being created that weren't there before. Presidents can do things that they couldn't have done before. And they may seem very tempting things to do, or even useful things to do. Drones obviously give a president options to deal directly with a source of threat. Um, I think there's, so technology, I mean, technology matters. It's silly to say that, 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 that war uh, whether you talk about its character or not, is not being changed by uh, new technologies. I think one of the difficulties we have is to assume that the way that we see these technological possibilities is the way that others see them. The obvious example, 
um, from you know, the moment in, uh, in Vietnam where, where the first smart weapons were introduced, the possibility of more discriminatory attacks became uh, a, a way by which we think. So up to that point, um, certainly going back, back through Korea, back into the Second World War, we had been responsible for indiscriminatory attacks on big centers of population. Um, all of a sudden, we couldn't have the excuse that we, there was no other way of doing it. During the Second World War, um, uh, the US Air Force, or the, the Army Air Force, uh, the RAF, uh, if they experimented to try to be, do attack targets with more precision, they just suffered heavy losses. So I think Little Hart put it, in uh, inaccuracy of bomb aim led to uh, uh, immor immorality of war aim. Uh, the, the, you just attacked uh, large centers of the population. Now we don't have to do that. And so over time, we, we uh, actually get offended, uh, and quite properly so, if large numbers of civilians are killed because it, it almost seems like a callous act. But that doesn't mean to say that other people think the same way mm. about, uh, about how they might use this technology. If you wanted to use the same technology, precise technology, you can use it to kill a lot of people. You can pick your targets to do that as well. Um, so we shouldn't assume that new technologies mandate a certain form of warfare. They just increase your options to fight in different ways. If you still want to kill large numbers of uh, innocents, you can kill large numbers of innocents, probably more efficiently than before. But we have an option not to do that. Uh, and I think it, it, it's the interaction between the technologies and the strategic culture and the overall political context in which you're operating uh, that, that changes things. It's not technology driving it by itself. So in 2003, we overthrew Saddam, mm. <coughs> and then, we made, we, and then uh, later we overthrew Gaddafi and, under a different administration, yet not seeming to have learned the, the kind of lessons. How, how common is that? Um, because you would have thought that um, you know, something that was relatively recent would inform the decision that took place in 2011, the understanding that vacuums create opportunities for other groups. Yes, uh, you would. Um, I think that, I mean, I think as, as explained earlier, part of the problem with Libya is, um, and I think you could argue with Syria as well, is everybody got terribly excited in 2011, Arab Spring, popular movements, like we got excited about the color revolutions in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine and Georgia and so on, without thinking through necessarily how this would work out. And we attached ourselves to very big political objectives on the assumption that the people would achieve this, i.e. the overthrow of Gaddafi and then the overthrow of Assad. Um, and then in both cases, but, but, but very starkly in the case of Libya, we found ourselves in the position where the good guys who were going to overthrow the bad guy uh, were about to be overwhelmed in Benghazi. So there was a panic uh, because the, the initial defeat of, for, uh, of our foreign policy was going to appear uh, with a massacre of, of people who we'd encouraged to act without very, doing very much to help them. So, that, so I think part of the problem with, with Libya was, was a conflict developing or, or a role developing um, not as a deliberate act of foreign policy but as an act of panic by and large in Europe uh, rather than in the United States. Um, and then you suddenly find, well, you, you know, we're just doing that as a humanitarian thing to protect a massacre, but you know, the war's going on. So you know, gradually, with the help of a UN resolution that the Russians haven't stopped when they might have done, uh, you're, you're able to do more. But w w we were always sort of behind the pace. W we weren't controlling it. Um, and I just don't think people had thought through. Um, if you're having a big militia-based war, um, we know from the past that, 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 that these things blur into criminality, they blur in, into warlordism, um, and it's very hard to control. But if we were going to do something, um, we would have needed, I think, to have put people on the ground much more. Um, you know, the, you know the, the, this sort of tired debate about boots on the ground and so on is right in a very basic sense. If if, you're, uh, if war is about 
political control. It's in the end about control of territory. And if you're not controlling the territory, there's a limit to what you can do. And you just have to accept that that's a limit to what you can do, or you have to put in the far greater effort than at the moment people were, and certainly in 2011, people were prepared to do. Why is there so much, so much optimism about war as an instrument of policy <coughs> when there's so much evidence that it usually doesn't achieve its aims? It's a good question. I mean, war disappoints. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's uh, um, you know, uh, you look back at, at, uh, at history and, and, you know, it's not the case that war never achieves anything. Um, war achieves things by and large defensively. That is, you know, if we look back at um, the Second World War, which most people think of as a good war, it just was a good war, um, it was because we were, we were responding to somebody who believed war could uh, rechange the map and uh, rechange uh, the, 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 um, the whole char social character uh, of Europe and the rest of the world. And so we fought that back, and that was a good war to achieve it. Uh, but in the end, uh, and, and in the end, it created other possibilities for a different sort of international order. Um, so states exist now because of war that wouldn't otherwise have existed. But the fact of war, um, and this goes back to the, the previous discussion, um, is most of them don't end. Um, you know, if you look mm -hmm. back uh, uh, at the history since 1945, um, you know, take two acts of partition in 1947 in Palestine and in the British Raj, my country being responsible, um, they produced a series of wars which are not quite over um, because they left sufficient contested territory and uncertainty that you could never solve it. So people believe, and you, know, you hear this often enough, that enemies can be eliminated and removed, but they keep on coming back because you can't remove your enemies. And the old days in which uh, sovereigns would go to war because of a particular dispute and have an understanding about how sovereigns dealt with these matters once it was over, they're past. Uh, once you had popular wars, it was very difficult to bring them to a satisfactory close. So the French Revolution changed everything? The French Revolution, um, well, the French Revolution first encouraged the idea of mass armies, uh, led to the, the mass armies and the Napoleonic Wars. I, I, if, if there's a French Revolution that changed a lot, arguably it was the one in 1871, um, because it was then that you have the it's an important moment when um, having been beaten by the Germans, um, the French don't give up. Uh, so you've had your battles at Sedan, so, uh, but the French don't give up. And you have this debate between uh, von Moltke and Bismarck about what to do about Paris. Uh, and von Molk, uh, Bismarck's worry is that if he don't, doesn't get this over quickly, then the French will bring in allies and it'll start to change. Um, and von Moltke doesn't think this is how, how, doesn't want to be given orders by Bismarck, apart from anything else. Uh, this is the moment when the operational art comes in, and the idea of this operational level of war at which politicians should stay completely clear of. It's the military responsibility. Anyway, Bismarck didn't believe that, uh, and he, he got his way. But I think that was the moment when von Moltke at least realized the importance of uh, popular will uh, 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 as, a, as a real problem for a professional military army. Um, and you know, one response to that, which you can see in the, uh, in the German general staff's initial response to um, colonial wars, and then even following through in, in, into the First World War, is that civilian populations do, are, are a target, are a legitimate target. So I, I, think, I think that was the, uh, those, you know, so step back a second. If you're going to use war as a political instrument, you've got to feel that you can use your armed forces decisively and you can contain it socially. Um, and both of those conditions, which are interdependent, have become increasingly qualified over, over time. Is there a sort of specifically Western uh, and, in fact, specifically American form of strategy? Well, American strategy was uh, always, in, you know, there's these two great figures from the interpreters of Napoleon, uh, Clausewitz and Jomini, and American strategy was always much more influenced by Jomini 
than by Clausewitz. And Jomini was a great believer in the decisive battle. Um, and uh, you, know, you can trace the influence of Jomini through uh, the elder man and the younger man. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, idea of, the idea that you can have a, a clash of arms which uh, settles the political matter. And this was taught at West Point. It was taught at West Point. Um, uh, and I think it's still a very strong influence on, on American thinking. Is it right? Um, it, no, uh, but in context, <laughs> Um, no, I mean, for all the reasons I'm saying, it's, it's very hard these days to have a uh, decisive war. And I think it's, it's the, the, the problem of the uh, idea of the operational level of strategy from which politicians are excluded, which goes back to Vietnam and grumbles about micromanagement and so on, leads to a belief that there are things that the military do which are quite separate from the things that the politicians do, and it means that neither side is pretty well inf informed enough about what the others are up to. And I think you know, that was some of the early discussions this morning. So, it's, I mean, it's not wholly, it's not wholly wrong because uh, if you're a country as powerful as the United States, then there, then there are things that you can do that others just can't do, and you, uh, uh, and you do have an uh, enormous capability. I think one of the things uh, you know, it, it leads to is actually, the, I'm not sure the Americans, oh, sorry, this sounds terribly patronizing to an American audience. Um, I don't think the Americans <laughs> always appreciate that it's your raw power that makes the difference. Um, you know, it, all this stuff about the revolution in military affairs and all this clever, cunning ways that you're going to use new technology, you know, the basic thing the US has got is more firepower than anybody else. <laughs> uh, and that's why you keep on winning, um, is, is because, uh, you know, the enemies can't really cope. If they want to stand up as a regular force against the United States, um, they can't cope. So that's why they go to guerrilla warfare and militias in the end. But this. Um, Germany's um, sort of decisive, you can see that in the debate between which Kennedy won at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Curtis LeMay was looking for a sort of first strike against mm. the Soviets, right? Well, um, so the influence at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis was still Korea mm. um, and the belief uh, uh, and the military irritation at the idea of limited war. Um, so the conclusion that the political military, the political establishment had reached as a result of Korea was that uh, uh, you had to accept there are certain things, wars you may have to fight, but you couldn't go the whole way because it was just too dangerous in the nuclear age, uh, which is not an unreasonable conclusion to reach. But the, but the military didn't like it uh, because Again, limited war went against the ethos. So, you know, you've got to remember, Kennedy had received during the um, Laos, he always called it Laos because he didn't want, think the Americans could go to war for a country called Laos. Um, <laughs> um, the, 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 during that crisis, he kept on getting proposals um, that involved limit, you know, tactical nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, so he'd lost confidence, uh, and also because of the Bay of Pigs, he'd lost confidence in military advice. Um, Actually, if you look at what the argument between, I mean, the, the, they barely met during the missile crisis in mean, one meeting, but if you look at the argument between what Curtis LeMay was proposing and what Kennedy was proposing, um, LeMay wanted preventive war. I mean, he just thought mm. this was the opportunity. They, they've laid themselves open. Let's get them now. Take your chance. Deal with the issue. Um, whereas Kennedy was much more conscious of the, the risks of escalation and. Uh, you know, fearful that, that it, the, the wrong moves would lead to some sort of nuclear catastrophe. So it, it was about, uh, it wasn't just a, a question of the different, different views of risk, it was also a question of political objectives. And, and there's a final point, of course, that, that one of the reasons that LeMay was irritating many people on the hawkish side of the debate then is because what the Air Force was proposing for an airstrike on Cuba was uh, a massive, a massive attack, lots of sorties, um, and the, you know the Dean Atchisons who, who, who were prepared to have a go, you know, were looking for the quotes unquote surgical strikes. So th th there's also you come back to the ethos of massive force leaving nothing to doubt, uh, 
uh, as being the right way to go about fighting a war as against those who are trying to think about more politically sensitive ways of using your force that achieve your objectives without creating worse problems. So you're writing a book on the future of war. <coughs> How do you go about it? <laughs> um, what, what I don't try to do is predict the future of war. Um, so it's about <laughs> the history. It's about the way people have thought about the future of war. So it starts, um, which I'm sure Rob may know about this, but most of you won't. There's a, f a famous book called The Battle of Dorking, um, <laughs> which came out in 1871, so related to these events that I was describing before, uh, which, in, which described the genre of books on the future of war, which is essentially to make a polemical point that if we don't uh, prepare ourselves properly before we know where we are. The Germans will be in Dorking and we'll be having... Uh, where is Dorking? Uh, near Guildford, yeah. southern, in, southern England. <laughs> yeah. You know where Guildford, you know <laughs> where Dorking is. Well, no, you're <laughs> it's the last place you'd expect to fight a war. That's the basic <laughs> place. It's not what they do there. Um, and, uh, and so, that, that opened up a genre of, 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 of literature on the future of war that is um, essentially designed to act as a warning, not as a prediction, but act as a warning, so that if you don't follow the advice of my book, then mm. you're going to get into trouble. Um, so, uh, and you know, more recent, ex well, I mean, P Pete Singer knows all about this, but there's more recent, exa uh, other example would be uh, General Hackett's book on the Third World War, which, you know, if, we, if only we uh, increase our defense expenditure to 3% of the NATO norm, then this war that's going to come in 1985 uh, will win. But if we don't, then we'll lose it. It's that, that fine a balance. So that, a lot of the writing on the future of war is that. One of the things that interests me is the interaction between the, this sort of literature and reality. Mm. Um, and one of you know, the most famous example is H.G. Wells' book, um, The World Set Free, in which he introduces the idea of atomic bombs. You know, atomic bombs are called atomic bombs because of that book. Um, because Leo Szilard, uh, the scientist in 1933, had that book in mind when he was reading about uh, uh, the science, nuclear scientist Rutherford's refu uh, dismissal of the idea that there could be a, a chain reaction that would lead to so much energy release. Um, and you know, it, the links between Wells and the scientists and Szilard and so on are, are quite close. So that's the start. But just to sort of where it goes on to, um, I guess it's also a challenge. I mean, you had Stephen Pinker here last year. It's a challenge to Pinker's view as well. I, I don't believe there's a science at work here. I think the, 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 it's a challenge to the view that, that if you look at the numbers carefully enough and you're really good at statistics, you can work all this out uh, because you can't. What you need to do is to understand war as part of a historical stream, put it, keep it in context, uh, and the fact that you've now got statistical techniques that allow you to compare very different episodes in military uh, conflict uh, between uh, diff separated in time and space, it doesn't really help you very much. You need to look at the history. So it all go it goes back to honor, interest, and fear, Thucydides. On, on, well, Thucydides is as good a guide to a lot of this as, uh, as many others. And um, we have time for some questions, uh, but not that much time, so keep them brief. We'll start with Harlan Ullman. Hello, Harlan. I'm Harlan Ullman. Laurie, good to see you, and it's, listen to your elegant appraisal of history. I'd like you to comment about transformation of strategy. In this sense, I've argued for a long time during the 20th century, we were spoiled with kind of a binary system of strategy. World War I, Central Powers versus the Allies, World War II, Cold War. And now we're in a much more complex environment. Take, for example, Syria, where you've got God knows how many participants, all with virgently, uh, divergent interest and views. So how do you use strategy and apply it in a sensible way to a situation such as Syria? Or is this just a soundbite that uh, is not going to lead to any kind of a satisfactory solution? Well, I don't think there's, a, there's certainly no satisfactory solution to a problem like Syria. If something's got to that state, um, you know, the, the idea that you can suddenly rewind and go back to 2011 when there's so much, uh, so many weapons around, so many factions created, so much bitterness, so much brutality, um, I mean, that's, that, that country is now scarred. So if you're trying to, 
uh, which is no reason to say that we, you don't try to do what you can, but you, the, the first step is to be realistic about what's happened to Syria. The second step is this basic problem in a, in a conflict like Syria that, that uh, once you've decided on your enemy, which we have, by, uh, by and large, then you've got to realize that other foreign policy objectives may go by the wayside um, in trying to deal with that. You can't achieve all of your foreign policy objectives at once mm. in, in the Middle East. Uh, everything you go in one direction makes it harder in another direction. So, you, you know, uh, and if you try to balance it all, then you may achieve nothing. So, it, it, you know, th these are real quandaries, and, and the, the why, in the end, strategy is an executive function. Somebody's just got to make a decision and say, this is what we do. Uh, but you've got to recognize there's going to be, it, 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 the, the result is not going to be very good. I um, mean, you know, in situations where my enemy's enemy is also my enemy, uh, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't work your way through uh, everything. You know, look at the relationship now between the Turks and the Kurds uh, and ISIS and so on and Russia. How, where do we stand on all of that? What's our view? I mean, we, in the end, Turks, Turkey's our ally, but it's not a simple situation in which there's an obvious thing to do. And it's what, I, you know, unless you have got a grip on these conflicts at a very early stage, which is a difficult and bold thing to have done, uh, but unless you do that, then you've got to accept you're, you're moving around in a very fluid and difficult situation. Jonathan here. Thank you. <coughs> Richard Ponzio with the Stimson Center. Professor Friedman, you brought up the end of World War II, the emergence of a new international order. Appreciate your thoughts on the emergence, uh, of the future of war, the topic of today's discussion, as it relates to the future of the global collective security system set up in 1945, in particular by our two countries and the mm. Atlantic Charter. Does it need to be radically overhauled, given the types of conflicts today, in particular the changing nature as it relates to the shift from interstate to civil war conflict? Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, the Atlantic Alliance, NATO, is one of the great achievements of, uh, of, of the post-war uh, states, men, they were all men. Um, and it's uh, played a vital role. Um, NATO is essential. Uh, the American alliance system is the most important thing the United States does. And it's one reason why we don't talk so much about interstate war, because it resolves a lot of the basic issues of, um, of, of conflict. Um, you know, what, what are the situations in which you see uh, war become more likely? It's often when alliance relationships are in flux. Uh, when alliances are being formed and reformed and so on. Uh, that's what was happening uh, uh, before the, uh, 19, the, the First World War. Um, so the great thing about NATO in particular is it exists, and it takes certain things out of the equation. The reason why we're not into Cold War II is because all the allies that Russia had when it was the Soviet Union are now members of NATO. Um, you know, they haven't got any allies. China hasn't got any allies, um, not to speak of. So, and the United States does, but maintaining that alliance network is one of the reasons uh, for international stability. So if you're worrying about the future of war and you're worrying about nuclear proliferation and other things, actually what you're doing a lot of the time is worrying about the ability and the readiness of the United States to sustain its international networks. Now, this isn't particularly uh, a system that's necessarily going to be great at dealing with civil wars and, and the, other, the other sorts of conflict. I think you need different sorts of international um, collective security arrangements to do that. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the problems we've got at the moment is partly as a result of what happened with Iraq and, and Afghanistan is that sort of appetite that appeared to be developing in um, the first decade of this century to uh, engage humanitarian interventions, right to protect. I mean, that has been knocked out of us because it just seemed to lead to grief, uh, no thanks. Uh, but actually, some of it was quite successful. Um, and I think the, the part of the challenge, I think, for the coming decade is whether we can work out how we engage in a number of, um, not all, but a number of these, these sort of uh, intrastate conflict. You know, you come back to the point that the basic you know, the, the, the best guide to uh, future war is past war. Um, and the best way to get out of the cycle, conflict trap, people have called it, of past war, uh, 
is to uh, is, is an external intervention. So I think that's that's the challenge. Uh, and you know the feeling that we just didn't do it very well, and we didn't do it very well in the last decade, uh, means it's, it's, a, it's a greater challenge than it seemed it would be. I want to thank Sir Lawrence Freedom for a really brilliant presentation, discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you.